So we'll come back on the seventh. <coughs> okay. And then I think it's just kind of wrapping up until the tenth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Rachel. Okay, so we're in chapter 15, starts off with a pasuk from the prophet Malachi that you will return and you will see the difference between the righteous person and the wicked person, the one who serves Hashem and the one who doesn't serve Hashem. And obviously the pasuk is telling us that there's a difference between a righteous person who serves Hashem and a wicked person does not serve Hashem. No, that's not what it means. That's what you would think it means. That's what it looks like. <clears throat> Says the Rebbe, no, we're talking about righteous, only talking about righteous people. But in the realm of righteous people, good people, there are those who are serving Hashem and those who are not serving Hashem. So not serving Hashem sounds negative. Why is they serving Hashem? Uh, Kate, I'd ask you to move your chair over one once this way or that way, but that seat is blocked where you're sitting. I can't see you, you can't see me. Good. And welcome to the class. How long? But what we uh, what comes out is that both terms, the one who serves God and the one who is not serving, does not serve God, are both good people, righteous people, bane on him. So what's the difference between them? The difference is that the one who serves Hashem is the bainani in who is struggling with his Yetzirah, that's called serving God. And the one who does not, no longer serve God, does not serve God, that's because he's finished. He's conquered his Yetzirah, he doesn't have a problem anymore, so I guess that's like a tzaddik. says here, page 223, in the last note here, that the one who is not serving God is a tzaddik who has completely finished his service of waging war with the evil within him. He has driven it away. It is gone. Like King David says in the, quoted in the first chapter, page two of the first chapter of the Tanya, libi cholo bekirbi, the word cholo means empty, and means a corpse. A halal is a dead body in the morgue. So the, the evil inclination is like a dead body in the morgue. It's dead. It's finished. However, there's a much deeper degree of tzaddik, and that is it's not dead. It's become good. It became a, it became a yetzer taiv. It's been converted. In other words, we can get to the point that even the Yetzahara, the animal soul, understands it's good. It's 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 good to it's good to be good. Good to be good. It's in its own for its own benefit. I there's a product on the market. You get in the store, it's called Sun Sweet. It's prunes. I like prunes. I sent them to some people for Shalach Manas. They were very grateful. It helps keep your system working properly. And they have a, a sign, a, a note, a, a slogan on the packaging. It says, it's good to feel good. So the Yetzer, the, 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 the one who is not serving God is not that he's negligent in serving God. He has become a servant of God. He's, he's, he's made it. It's a descriptive term. It's not a term of his, concerning his activity. He is a servant of God. He's, he's, he's finished with, this, with the war with his HR. The tzaddik has a different kind of war. The war of the tzaddik is that he, he has to fight the war of the whole Jewish people. 
When you're a king and you have an army that doesn't want to fight, what do you do? You need them to fight the war. You have to motivate them. You have to inspire them. You have to supply them with all their needs. You have to keep them focused on what's the difference between right and wrong. And you can't afford to just be a king and enjoy the luxuries of, of kingship. Can't. So the, the, the struggle of the tzaddik in a way is to commit himself to the leadership and the, like a shepherd. You know, the difference between the shepherd and the sheep is a world of difference. So why should a per person so accomplished as a shepherd, like Moshe Rabbeinu was a shepherd, David Amel was a shepherd. What are these astonishingly great people doing with sheep? Daka Vavina was a shepherd. The Avos, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov were shepherds. Hevel, the son of Adam, was a shepherd. That's the struggle of the tzaddik. To give up all his understanding and sensitivity and devote all his powers to helping others. And not just to bask in the, in the, the glory of his beautiful perception of, of godliness, which is like the world to come. Okay, now so we understand that this pasuk is not about good people and bad people. It's about benonim and tzaddikim. Now he goes on where it says, one Shavat, page 223, the bottom. In this category, yesh we also have, can apply this pasuk to the Benini, where there are two levels. The one who serves Hashem and one who doesn't serve Hashem. Well, how could that be? How can we say that there's a such a thing as a Benini who does not serve Hashem? He qualifies at page 224 at the top. Doesn't mean that he's wicked. It means he does not wage war with his evil nature anymore. This is something we have to understand clearly. Kate, the Benoni is a person who never did a sin. Never will do a sin. He could. Free choice is never taken away. Chaim and Asha. Free choice is never taken away. He can always make a wrong move, a wrong decision. You can, the Yezahar could still fool him, but it doesn't. That's why he's a Benini, because if it does fool him, he does something. He's a Russia, he's not a Benini anymore. You follow? So the Benini never committed a transgression. And he goes on to say, kol ha he, he fulfills. And I say, well, maybe he commits a transgression through negligence. No, if a person, a young lady, doesn't light a Shabbos candle on Friday afternoon, so she didn't do something bad, she neglected to do what her obligation was. Well, this person, the Benini, he does fulfill all his obligations, all the positive commandments, that's possible for him or for her to fulfill. There are the majority of our positive commandments you cannot do. Sorry to tell you. You would, you would like to do them, but you cannot do them because we don't have the base Hamikdash. Most of the commandments of the 613 are connected with the base Hamikdash, which was taken away from us. And we pray every day that it should be returned. And sometimes people wonder, what's it going to be like? Am I going to have to bring a goat and a sheep to the base of Migdash and take care of it or go there and buy it from somebody and then take it and give it to a person? You know, it doesn't seem to me that that's not my thing. I'm not a farm person. Why? I grew up in the city. You know, why am I going to have to do this? However, these days we're learning Rambam about purity and especially purity and sacrifices. If you think about it, normal food that we eat, we want it to be kosher. We don't want to eat food that's not kosher. There, if I want to eat holy food, 
food that's uh, dedicated, truma. The rules are more strict. I have to be very careful about it. If truma touches something that's impure, I can't have it. It has to be burned. So we have to be very careful with truma that it shouldn't come in contact with anything that's impure. And if a thing is a sacrifice, truma is food dedicated, it's, for, it's meant for the koyan to eat. Koyan's work is in the base of Middash. How's he supposed to eat? What's he, where he's supposed to earn a living? Well, the Jewish people supply, support him. We give him a portion of our harvest all the time. It's called truma. And it's not regular food. Ordinary people cannot eat food that's designated as truma. Now we won't move up a higher level to sacrifices. And at food that we want to bring to the base of English that she burned on the altar of Hashem, like on the Passover, we don't actually do it. We only make a hint of it. We're bringing the Paschal lamb, good morning, which would be offered in the base of Migdosh. And the best parts would be burned on the altar of God. They would be for him. And the meat would be for us. And that would be our, 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 our meal at the Seder. And just like it's great to eat the matzah and all the other condiments that we have in the Seder service, so the highlight of the meal is eating the lamb chops, the meat from the roasted lamb, the roasted meat, barbecued lamb, yum. But it has to be kept in strictest holiness. The one bringing it has to be holy and pure. He can't bring it if he is impure. If he touched anything that's impure, or consumed anything that's impure, he can't bring it. He's not allowed in the base of Migdash. And the animal has to be learning this week's Parsha. Has to be without a blemish, and has to be a certain age. It has to be an animal we're bringing as a sacrifice. Many, very, very strict rules and qualifications of what kind of an animal could be brought as an offering, and it's being brought as your offering. It's connected with your soul. You can't, God does not want human offerings. That's a fundamental principle that we forget about, that in the past, in the ancient days, that's what pagan nations did. They brought human offerings to God. Hashem says, no, that's not the idea. I want you to bring yourself as an offering. Offer me your will, your desires. Give those to me. I'll take an animal instead, but the animal has to be fit to serve, to be given, given to God. It has to be pure. So can imagine after you've learned and obeyed all the laws about purity and, and been so careful, and you're bringing now your carbon to the base of Migdash, and it's going to be burned on the altar of God, and some of it is going to come to your holiday to your yont of table to be consumed by you and your wife and your children and your grandchildren. Very exciting experience, a hot, very, very exciting experience. And a person thinks, yeah, but am I gonna bring a smelly goat? Do I have to take care? Yes, it's gonna be extremely, extreme. you're gonna think about it toad in a totally different way. It's something you've, you've worked just like when you cleaned your house for Pesach for days and weeks, and finally the house is spick and span, absolutely chametz free, and Pesach begins. How do you feel about your house? Very happy about it, excited because you. Well, this, this is what it's going to be like. Okay, so this person who is no longer serving Hashem, he's done all that. Now he's just bringing his his pure. Offering, which is everything has been has prepared. He did everything he had to do, including Torah study, which weighs against all the other mitzvahs. So there's really a Muslim, that is to say, a complete, completed person. Even in the realm of Torah, he's taking advantage of every single second. There's no time waste whatsoever, as we learned about Rabbah on the first page of the Tanya. How could he consider himself a Benini if he's on this level of purity and fulfillment and he doesn't waste a single second that he, he, he in fact, 
when it came time for him to leave this world, which was very young, he was only 40 years old, it says the angel of death couldn't take him because his mouth did not stop saying words of Torah. And that was the words of Torah repel the angel of death. Had to trick him into, into stopping to, to recite words of Torah for a split second and grabbed him as he was falling. His mouth does not cease, does not stop saying words of Torah. Ella, so why is he called someone who doesn't serve God? He's not struggling with the Yetzirah anymore. He's not wrestling like Yaakov with the angel who wrestled through, with, the, with, the, with the angel through the night. The angel wanted to kill him. To conquer it. This person is not serving God. He doesn't have to conquer his Yetzirah. He conquered it already. And how did he conquer it? Al Yedei or Havaya through the light of Hashem, Hameir al Nefesh Eloh, is like we said before in the last chapter. If it wasn't for Hashem standing by the side of the poor person, he would never overcome the Yetzirah. It was very powerful. So how can we prevail over him? Because we have Hashem on our side, and Hashem shines upon us into our mind and into our heart, and He keeps us focused and gives us the strength and the endurance to prevail. Okay, so Hashem is there, shining in his Nevishalakis, Hashubamayach, which reveals itself to him in his brain and the quality of Chachma. That's the tippy top of his faculties, the lightning rod. And it comes in from Chachma into Bina, into Das, and into the right side of his heart to inspire him with love of Hashem. Hashalit al Halev, and then therefore rules over the heart. Like we described all of this. In great detail, page 225. Kogoin. For instance, what kind of person is this? What kind of person are we talking about? I can't imagine such a person. Sounds like the Rebbe, and you're saying he's a Benini. Kogain, imagine. Shumasmid believe Belimude. He is a Masmid. What does it mean a Masmid? A Masmid is a person who loves to learn. He learns the whole time. Someone came to the Tzemach Tzedek once and said, Rebbe, I have a big problem in serving Hashem. He says, what's your problem? He says, I don't like learning. It puts me to sleep. I don't understand it. It's boring. I can't do this. Give me a job. I'll be a driver. I'll go on with I'll, I'll, I'll clean. I'll help. I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'll write. I'll play music, I'll do whatever I have to do, but please don't make me sit and learn. I don't have a head for learning. Please leave me, leave me out of this. No, this guy is the opposite. He loves, so this, this person came to Samuel Sadek. He said, Rebbe, I don't like to learn, I have a big problem. Samuel Sadek said, let me comfort you. I have a much bigger problem than you. He said, you have a problem, Rebbe? He says, yeah, I have a problem. He says, what's your problem? He says, I love to learn. I love to learn. It's my, it's my greatest pleasure in life. I could learn and do nothing else. My problem is I'm not able to learn the whole time because I have responsibilities to the Jewish people. One time the Tzemach said that complained to his son, his youngest son, the Rebbe Shmuel, came the Rebbe Maharash. He said to him, oi, 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 oi. There's so many people that are lining up that want to talk to me about their problems. I have to get involved in all of their issues and all of their foibles and all of their nonsense and, and steer them and guide them like a shepherd guides the sheep. You know, that's what he's talking about. If I only had time to learn, I could accomplish so much. And the Rebbe Shmuel said to him, Tate, Tate, look at these books here. These are books that you wrote. Look at the thousands of hours you spent editing the, the memoriam of, of your Zayda, the Alter Rebbe. How do you think you had the ability to do it? You were able to do that because you spent time with all these people who come to you with, your, with their problems. And he said, um, I guess you're right. <laughs> you're right. But from this, why did I tell you the story? Sarah Mora just joined the shir. I saw her. 
because to enable you to understand what is he talking about, a person who's a masmid but temperament. He loves to learn. We're talking now about a benini, two levels of the benini. One is a person who is serving Hashem and one who has, is no longer serving Hashem. We said earlier that that's the difference between a tzaddik and a benini. Now we're saying in the realm of the benini, we have both these levels. Okay, so one of these levels that corresponds to the tzaddik, but he's still a benini, is a person who is a masmid but teba. He's naturally, he naturally loves to learn. That's his temperament. He has an excess of black bile in his chemical, in his chemistry, in his physical chemistry. Black bile, it corresponds to the element of earth in the Nevesha Bahamas. That's its physical element. And this causes a person to be very heavy and unexcitable. He's not excited, doesn't get excited. You know, they say red-haired people are very excitable. You know, people like that, they have a short fuse, they fly off the handle, they get very excited about things, they're, they're, they're quick, they run to do things. And then there are people who are very slow to do things and very careful to do things. And to get them to smile, it can be a big accomplishment. But, you know, but they're very careful. They're very good. They're, they don't make mistakes. So this is this person he's talking about that he loves to learn by nature. He's very careful. He doesn't waste his time. And he has no more conflict with his Yetzirah. And he's cold. His nature is cold. He doesn't have tivas for intimacy, physical intimacy with the... Uh, the opposite sex. So he's, he's not driven. He has, he's a, a cold kind of a character, but he's very religious. So he could be a Benini because he doesn't do anything wrong. He does everything right that he's supposed to do. And even he will fulfill the midst of serving Hashem with joy. He will be joyous, but not spontaneous. It's lacking spontaneity. That's what it seems to me from this description. And similarly, other things. They do not excite him. I've told you this story. It's a funny story about the Rosh Hashiva of Brunois, the Yeshiva in France. When he got out of communist Russia, he, became, became, he was a brilliant person, a great scholar. He established a Yeshiva. And he used to hammer into the students that they shouldn't indulge themselves in worldly pleasures. And the epitome of worldly pleasures was ice cream. I had an aunt, Alea Sholem, her name was Elka. My mother loved her so much, she was, a, she was a riot. She was a lot of fun. She used to say, ice cream was made for kings and me. <laughs> she liked ice cream. So this is Rabbi Nemanov, he used to tell the students and they shouldn't have ice cream. The, my nephews would come from Israel for kvutza, and they would come and eat with us. And my wife sometimes would serve ice cream. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't touch the ice cream. It was drummed into their heads by the Rosh Hashivah. A bocher, doesn't eat ice cream. One time there was a wedding, and uh, they served and uh, ice cream. And the student, one of the students came over and said, Rabbi, you always told us that we're not supposed to eat ice cream. What's going on with here? here what's going on here? He says, what do you mean? He says, what do you got? You're eating ice cream. He says, oh, that's ice cream. I thought it was cold soup. <laughs> I thought it was cold soup. Cold soup is just sad. What? Cold soup is sad. When you go to eat like a nice warm bowl of like broccoli cheddar. Oh, well, it depends how hot it is outside. <laughs> no, I, I don't want cold soup. You don't want, okay. Malka doesn't cold. identify with this story. Mechain, well, maybe he didn't like cold soup either. Maybe by him, he thought that was called his kafia, subduing your, your, your desires for worldly pleasure. Similarly, all the pleasures of this world are not interesting 
to this person. He's just not, he's not into it. He's not a pleasure seeker. He has no hana, no pleasure from the physical world. And therefore, we're now on the fourth paragraph of page 225. You got the place? Everybody, Hana got the place? 225. Oh, I love your smile. Okay. <laughs> it's even bigger. How's your mom doing? Does your mother like the pleasures of this physical world? Yes, we all do. Okay. But this, this is a bane in it. He doesn't. Here's Tova. Tova's a good student. She's a master, mistress of the good name. I have a niece by the name of Tova. She married my nephew. Lochain, therefore, page 225. We said, in order for a person to serve Hashem with real love, he has to think about the greatness of Hashem, which these days is easy because the world is crying out to us, is singing to us about the greatness of Hashem. And we see the life, the world coming to life. And it's the obvious conclusion when you see the world coming to life, when you see the trees coming to life and the flowers pushing up and the tulips in the flower bed and the crocuses and, and the animals scampering around. And the world is so interesting to look at. And you understand that the one who's giving life to all of these things in the world is giving life to me too. Even the squirrels. Even the squirrels, that's right. We had a squirrel in our house the other day. Ew. In the, I got, yeah, yeah. I, got, I came home from work and Did I was told, oh, there's a squirrel in the house. I said, what? My son said, yeah, he's between the two doors, between the outside door and the inside door. And all of a sudden, he comes zooming through the house, and my son says, someone must open the inside door. <laughs> he comes zooming in the house and zoom down the stairs oh, into, the, into the basement and zoom to the front of there. And my son comes back with a smile on his face. It's okay. He's between the two doors in the basement. He closed the door on him. And, and, but, but later, he went to see what's doing with him. Nowhere in sight. He must have found his way up underneath the steps to the house and opening and squeezed through and just found, found his freedom. So we understand he found his freedom. But you know, squirrels are funny creatures. We had a problem with squirrels once in the house. And and Michal Raskin, all of a sudden, just passed away. Wonderful person in the, in the, who ran the fruit store in the corner of Kingston and, and the president. He was a great, wonderful, warm-hearted person. He said he had a squirrel trap. I said, you have? We could use that. So he gave it to me. Well, how do you bait a squirrel trap? With peanut butter. <laughs> Squirrels love peanuts. And they smell the peanut butter. They just go crazy. And they enter the trap and they can't get out. And he's jumping around, jumping and jumping, jumping and jumping around. So we took the trap and put it in the car, took it down to Coney Island and let it out. He was very happy. Guess what? Squirrels are very good navigators. He found its way back. Well, we didn't tag the squirrel. But they do find their way back. They do indeed. If they if they have a place, the only things the squirrels don't find is they don't find where they hide their nuts. And because of that, that's nature's way of enabling trees to spread their seed. So if they can't find their nuts, you should this is one of the nuts. miracles of nature, girls. It's worth studying. It's so interesting. How the trees and plants growing things which cannot move avoid overpopulation. If they're all going to drop their seeds by their base, there's not going to be any room for them all to grow. So each different plant and, and growing thing has its own way of spreading its seeds, whether on helicopters. You know, we used to put them on our nose when we were kids, right? Helicopters, or uh, they roll, or they, the birds Velcro. Hashem invented Velcro. He, he made it on plants called burrs. They stick on the clothing of animals and, and people who pass through the woods, and then they brush it off, and so the, the seed gets spread around. Okay, so that, another way the seeds get spread around is squirrels love nuts, and they store them. 
in the earth. They find all kinds of hiding places and forget where they were. Never happened to you? You forgot where something was? Yeah, well, it happens to squirrels all the time. But they do find their way back to a good feeding ground. So therefore, this person is so sensitive, he sees the life and everything, and he understands that that life and everything is in him too, in himself too. So it doesn't take a lot of effort for him to understand that Hashem is the source of all life, and this is his knowledge, and therefore he has... And just like you love your life, no matter how much of a down kind of a person you are, you don't want anybody to kill you. And you don't want to be sick. You want to be alive and well and healthy. That is a love of Hashem. It's just this place you call it health and wellness. It's really a love of life. And Hashem is a source of life. So it does. it's not hard for him to have a love of Hashem and to avoid doing things that are going to harm his life and limit him from his godly activities, learning Torah and doing mitzvahs. So it's easy for him also to keep them negative mitzvahs. Shalei lavor al mitzvahs le sasan, not to transgress any negative mitzvahs. We're coming out to the bottom of 225, moving right along. The Abbas Hashem believed by his heart is, be, is filled with love of God. Because he desires, desires, he wants to be connected to Hashem the whole time. He's not interested in going to the movies. He's not interested in just hanging around. If he's going to go for a walk, he'll take his grandchildren for a walk. He'll tell them stories. He'll turn it into a positive Torah experience. And he, so he clings to Hashem by doing mitzvahs. And Talmud Torah Kanega Kulam, and he clings to Hashem by learning Torah the whole time. I had a friend, Mr. Glick from London, he used to say to me, Look at the difference between an elderly Jew and other people. An elderly Jew, you see him sitting there with a book in his hand. He doesn't waste time, he's learning, he's learning something, not just staring into space. Two guys sitting on a bench, one says to the other, What are you doing today? He says, Nothing. So what's the way you going to do? That? You're not doing nothing. He says, you did that yesterday. He says, I didn't finish. Ella died. That was a joke. <laughs> I think it was a very good joke. Ella, it's one of my favorites. Ella. Dailohei. <laughs> it's enough for this person, the hidden love, in the, in the depths of his heart and his psyche, it's easy for him to awaken that love. Every person has this love. Everybody. Especially the girls in this class, that's why you're all here, because someone awakened that love and pointed out to you that you have this love of Hashem in your, in your heart, and you said, where do I learn more? And they sent you here. This is called Abba Mesuteras, hidden love in the heart of every single Jew. Whoever you meet, you go to the mall and you meet some little old lady. She can be a big old lady. She could be a young lady. And you give her a Shabbos candle and her heart lights up with light and warmth. Oh, that reminds me, my Bubby used to light candles and I used to love to stand by her when she did it. And Thank you, dear, she says. <laughs> right? That's the hidden love in the heart of every person. And that's very easy for this person with a cold nature to arouse that love by a simple process of uh, thinking and coming to the obvious conclusion that Hashem is the source of the, my life and I love my life. I love Hashem. And I want to do what he wants me to do. Page 226. And for this reason, it's so easy, he's considered one who doesn't serve Hashem. There's no struggle. Easy peasy. Yes. Um, I thought the point of like abandoning was that you still had to struggle. Can't hear you. I thought like the difference between a tzaddik and abandoning is that abandoning still has a struggle. So how does a type of abandoning not have a struggle? That's what we're talking about. This is abandoning. He never does a sin. Yeah. But, but he's just by nature. He's called. He's not struggling. 
but he's not a tzaddik because he didn't convert the negativity that's in him. He does have negativity in him, but he didn't. He, he, it doesn't overpower him. It doesn't make him sin. Um, but he never converts it to good. So he remains a benini, not a tzaddik. He still has the Yetzirah. And he says here, page 226, this love is not really a great achievement on his part. That's how Hashem made him. Hashem made him with this inherent love. You have it. I have it. We all have it. But it's not his achievement. He didn't, he didn't work hard to get it. So, like the Benini who is serving Hashem. So basically, if the Benini is not serving Hashem, it's because... He's not actively struggling. Okay. Really yes, somewhere. exactly, exactly. Uh, this is a very hard, uh, Liba and, and Samantha, you, both of you have the same problem. I also have a problem with this, understanding it, because I don't know people like that. How could a person be like this and not be a tzaddik? But it, say, it seems like it's just a person never does anything wrong, right, like a goody goody. But it doesn't say, uh, sorry, it doesn't say in some places that it's only like for that moment, like a person could be like, it depends what he he's doing. Like when he's doing a Nevera, he's called a Russia, but after he comes back with two of us, so he's not. Uh, maybe, like could be, it's a good suggestion. So he is, is, this is a person who is not serving Hashem because he's not struggling to achieve love of Hashem. It's easy for him to have this love of Hashem. And the love of Hashem is, it, it is, is awakening. It's awakening him the whole time. Out, out, damn spot. Uh, it's, But it's, it's, it's not an achievement. The Benini who serves Hashem is an achiever. This person is not really an achiever, but he's not a, he's not a Russia. He's not a Russia. So if he's not a Russian, he's not a Tzaddik, he's a Benini. How could it be such a person? He says, this is a person, this is a person who's naturally a cold fish. A cold fish, but he warms himself up a little bit because he knows he's supposed to. It's it's described like he does mitzvahs on Hashem Melumada. I'm venturing. I'm not sure. I've never heard this from any of my teachers, but it seems like he does things by rote. He does things because it said this is what you're supposed to do, and he's very careful about it, and he even loves Hashem because that's what you're supposed to do. And if you can't love, you can't love Hashem just because. So you have to meditate on Hashem's greatness so he meditates on Hashem's greatness he's smart he's able to do it he does it he feels love and he serves Hashem but he's not really an achiever he doesn't have challenges he's not a tzaddik the tzaddik overcomes all his challenges it's a very hard lot that he's describing. A person born like this is going to have a very hard lot in life. Now he goes on to this to uh, just let's just finish up this one section here. We were speaking about somebody who is naturally studious. He loves to learn, right? But that's his nature. What about a person that's not his nature, but he worked on himself and he doesn't waste a minute. He trained himself to learn the whole time. He trained himself to learn and learn and learn and learn. I remember when I used to go to the base of Medrash here on Eastern Parkway, when uh, there was a young man there, uh, his name was Grossbaum, the son of the Shlich in Long Island at Stony Brook. And uh, he, I, I said, this, this, I, 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 
pointed out to the person in charge, said, this boy is really amazing. I see he's sitting learning at this desk the whole time. He doesn't waste a second. He's, he learns the whole time. He doesn't talk to the other boys. He just learns and learns and learns and learns. And I saw his father. I'm friendly with his father. I said, that's some boy who got there. He says, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he laughed. He says, it's not my lot in life, but he, he really, he, he, he just, he trained himself to learn. So, his, so it became second nature. Here you go. Ad shalei teba shen, it's second nature. Page 227. Dai loi ba'aba and his natural love of Hashem, like we said, is the natural love in the heart of every Jew is enough for him. El imkein reitz alil meyoyser mira gilusa, unless he's going to push himself and learn more than he usually does. And here, this is going to distinguish a subcategory of the Benini, who is not an achiever, but in that category, we have an achiever. An achiever who is not an achiever. That's, he's not fighting as Yetzirah, but he's overachieving, he's pushing himself constantly to do a little more. And, and in practical terms, I saw just the other day that the Rebbe said, about, said to somebody to, who said they found mitzvahs not inspiring, the Rebbe said, you should therefore try to constantly do more. How can I do more? He said, you give, cha give charity every day and add one penny. So if you do give five cents today, give six cents tomorrow. By the end of the year, you'll give three and a half dollars more than at the beginning. It's not, it's not going to be hard. When you get used to giving three and a half dollars, you'll give three dollars and a half plus one more. We're going to, we'll continue tomorrow. And Mr. Shem, we're going to finish the chapter. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. You're my you are my teachers. And now, I'm going to say a bracha chreino in a siddur. Bracha tovim. Talk that. Talk this over with your friends. See if you can under, come to understanding of what what the Rebbe is saying here. And come come back tomorrow with your conclusions. I'm, I'm very interested to know how you how you deal with how you understand this. I find it hard to understand because I just don't know anybody like that that I can uh, identify with. Can you? Rabbi, how do you sleep past? I get to give you more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Still morning. I know. Glad it is. I don't know when it belongs to come back. Thank you.